FirstNet is one of those opportunities to make a fundamental difference in every public safety responder's approach to managing emergencies. You've got agencies converging onto one central geographic location. Communication and getting resources where they need to be is a challenge. By no fault whatsoever of the individuals that are there responding to the scene, it's the technology that they had available to them. They're trying to coordinate a disastrous mass chaos. This is when the network gets bogged down. And they can't communicate with one another because the system was not set up to do so. The technology that they've used to this point really pales in comparison to what we're going to provide them on FirstNet. This individual is missing. This is their potential location. And then we can call for a helicopter to have live infrared searching for an individual. Captain, take your guys now. Communications between agencies and among agencies. Always talking, always up on the network, always using the data, live in real time. I need everybody inside. Keep the communication open, please. So we can search quicker, we can find people quicker, and then as soon as we find a victim, we can get them extricated, triaged, treated, transported to the hospital. Come here. You're okay now. Take him out first, he's really hurt. We're putting tools in their hands that they can see what's happening around them and react to it in a way that saves lives. I'm really proud to be part of something that's going to revolutionize public safety. We're going to take really good care of them. Thank you. Please welcome Andre. Thank you, Arpit. Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's really great to be here back at ONS, and I, uh, I really want to just thank everyone that's participating, especially those out on the web. And, um, you know, a lot of changes going on over the last uh, year. And uh, ONS actually is uh, my favorite conference to come to because I believe. Uh, this is really where all the real big change is going to happen, and it's happening with many of you. And I'm really excited that we actually got ONS back to the Bay Area um, from Los Angeles last year, because I think this is really um, where a lot of this software-defined networking revolution started. Um, uh, but certainly, it's now a global phenomenon, and it's um, and you being here and the, uh, the companies and the communities you represent is a testament to that. So really great to be back here. And I um, also just wanted to uh, say uh, just thank you for everyone that's, um, you know, all the demo booths and things going on, really exciting things going on. And um, your participation is so important because uh, as you saw in that video, um, this technology is having an impact everywhere. Uh, not just you know, the, the, the normal mass market consumer, but all the way to you know, first responders and uh, the technology you're gonna see, and I'll talk a little bit about it, um, is actually at the heart of those services you saw in that video. So really great stuff going on. So let me talk a little bit about AT&T and by the numbers here and the clicker is not working. Okay, there we go. Um, AT&T, you know, we talk a lot about what we're doing here in the United States, but I want to remind folks here, we're a global company. In fact, we connect the world, we connect to over 214 countries and territories. Um, a lot of what we do isn't just wireless technology, we do a lot of uh, wired technology as well and you can see there we actually have well over 1.1 million fiber route miles around the world and the traffic across this network is growing at an unprecedented clip 
So right now, the traffic that we haul every day has now uh, eclipsed over 250 petabytes a day. You put that in perspective, you know, think about the entire uh, Library of Congress. That actually fits into about a quarter of a petabyte. So every day we are actually hauling back and forth a thousand libraries of Congress across the network. Um, pretty impressive. Um, when you look at that traffic, the majority of that traffic, a little over 50% of it, is actually video-based traffic. So if you didn't believe that video is really taking off and growing, I can tell you it already is here and it's just going to continue to grow. In fact, over the next several years, we predict video will be uh, well, well over 70% of the traffic we haul. Now, on the wireless side of this, um, we've been talking a lot about 5G, and we're really excited to have launched our first mobile 5G cities uh, late last year. Uh, those were 12 cities. We also have nine that we announced for this year that will, um, uh, will be coming online here soon. And I'm proud to say San Francisco and San Jose are on that list. So you'll be excited about that. <clears throat> and, you know, again, data demand is, is just booming. So I mentioned that 250 plus petabytes a day. If you go all the way back to when the first smartphone started to emerge back in 2007, that represents over a 470,000% increase in traffic demand. So it's a pretty significant hockey stick that we're seeing here. Now, going out into the future here, uh, the tsunami of demand is not uh, abetting at all. Um, in fact, if you look at some analyst reports out there, specifically the Cisco uh, Virtual Networking Index report just released about a month ago, uh, they predict another 3x increase in the global IP traffic. Um, and when you look at the effects of the mobile side of that, they predict a 7x increase in mobile IP traffic. And there's a prediction that over 70% of that traffic in five years will actually be coming from wireless devices. So if you don't believe 5G is uh, gonna drive this, well, I'm here to tell you it, it's really gonna open up the doors here. And I think you can see why. 5G is a technology that's really going to drive uh, hyper-connectivity. So it's not just connecting smartphones and tablets, it's gonna be connecting everything. The capabilities of the network are gonna give us the capability to more cost-efficiently connect millions of devices within a square mile, whereas today we can probably only do thousands. And so, that's why 5G is so important, and really the heart of 5G, the foundations of 5G are really based on the fundamentals of software-defined networking and virtualization. So a lot going on there. So let me talk a little bit about sort of the journey we've been on over the last five years or so. And it really started with John Donovan uh, and this great vision to really embrace software-defined networking and bringing this transformation from a hardware-centric network to a software-centric network. And we're really pleased that John is actually now our CEO. So if you're ever questioning the commitment, uh, we have it all the way to the top. And that's really important because as you can see, AT&T, uh, we like to feel that we are uh, not just major contributors but major leaders uh, in this whole revolution that's going on. So if you go back to 2014, we announced our SDN vision, actually right here at ONS. It was actually a lot smaller crowd. Um, <clears throat> and then quickly in uh, 2015, uh, with some great work with uh, uh, ONF and many others, we uh, started virtualizing our GPON OLT uh, architecture to take advantage of AT&T's fiber footprint. And we expanded that by actually working with the Open Compute Project to put a lot of that technology, the hardware 
uh, into the open so that we could start developing open source software on top of it. Then in 2016, uh, we put into the open our eComp platform, which became later named ONAP. Um, everything you saw in that video, that first net video, is actually automated and orchestrated with ONAP, that first net network. Uh, everything we're doing in terms of our 5G deployment is taking advantage of ONAP and many other software <clears throat> open source projects that are going on. And I really want to give a shout out to Chris Rice and Igal Obez and their leadership teams, and many of which are here in this room today, uh, because they really have taken this vision and made it a reality. And really, really great work there. Then in 20, okay, nice <laughs> applause there, thank you. Then in 2017, uh, we announced uh, our first live trial on a white box switch. This was a really an industry first in the carrier space uh, for us. And then in 2018, last year, we announced uh, a white box uh, a router for our cell sites, where we'll be deploying over the next uh, few years here, over 65,000 of these. In fact, we have these in production now. And um, you can actually see some of that implementation in one of the booths back there. So really encourage you to go check it out. So a lot going on there. Okay, so all this, um, all these great things happening. So what are they happening on? Well, it's really on a foundation of some amazing open source projects out there. And you know, this, this isn't a journey we've done by ourselves. We've really done it with some great partnerships and a really, really great developer communities out there and all of you. And <clears throat> when you look at a lot of these um, logos out here, uh, there's ones that certainly stand out more. Some have been out there a little longer than others, but I would tell you all of these are equally important because they're all part of this great vision and solution, this puzzle, if you will, that we're putting together here. And we're learning a tremendous amount, and we're learning it at a velocity that we've never had before, and we're learning it with a much greater community, and this is allowing these capabilities to lower the entry barrier for more innovative solutions and players to come into the mix. And so this is what this whole open source initiative is uh, really all about. So let me get into a little more specifics on a few of these that are going on. So just to highlight a couple and related to some of the announcements we just made. Um, <clears throat> So in the last year here, we talked a lot about um, our data centers using white box switches. Um, a lot of those we have now in place that are carrying live 5G traffic. Um, as I mentioned, a lot of this is powered by ONAP. And this is part of our big uh, push to virtualize and SDN control our network. If you recall back five years ago, almost five years, four years ago, we set out a very audacious goal to SDN control and virtualize 75% of our network. And I'm proud to say, uh, end of last year, uh, we hit the 65% mark. Uh, so we're, we're almost there. And this year, our goal is to get to 70%. A lot of folks have asked me, well, hey, wait a minute, Andre, some years you've done 20%, why now only five? Well, we kind of left all the hard stuff for last. So um, we're well on a path here to get to our goal of 75% by the end of 2020. And, uh, and again, really due to the really great hard work uh, by many in this room. Also, we're really excited about how open source is now going to unlock and open a part of the network where we've seen a tremendous amount of technology and vendor lock-in, and that's the radio access network. So just yesterday, uh, in partnership with ORAN, that's the Open uh, Radio Access Network Alliance, uh, in, uh, in collaboration with Nokia, AT&T and Nokia 
contributed and introduced the first piece of open source software for what we call the RAN Intelligent Controller. And we're really excited about this because this is a, uh, just the beginning here to start opening up the capabilities of the radio access network to not only give us more visibility of what's going on, but give us more control. So this is gonna allow us to better utilize our RAN assets and resources, but also to allow us to create more value add services and experiences for our end customers. In fact, we've got a really cool demo that I encourage all of you to go check out that actually shows this uh, RAN intelligent controller, we call it the RIC, uh, actually in use. And it's uh, a, a really great testament and shows, about, uh, shows how a near, time, a near real time controller can work. And uh, we think this is just the beginning here uh, in the RAN space. Also, we just recently um, uh, made some great advances here in the transport layer, and this is with our Open Rotom initiative. And we expect AT&T to be the first to 400 gig. Um, of course, with the tsunami of demand that's gonna come with 5G, we've gotta have a backbone, a transport network that can handle that tsunami. And really, we've got to upgrade from 100 to 400, and a lot going on there. And also, what's dry, helping us drive this is this Open Rotom initiative that's bringing in uh, more interoperability. Again, traditionally a space at the network where there's a lot of lock-in in terms of the technology and only a few players. Um, now we've gotten to sort of break that open so that we can get a lot more competition and intermix and match and again, lower the entry barrier to get more innovation into that space. So very exciting work going on there. And this partnership here was really, um, we recently formed this um, with Siena, Fujitsu, uh, Orange, uh, and others. And we did this and demonstrated this uh, and, uh, just recently uh, where we showed how this actually can work together quite effectively. And I think you're gonna see some really exciting advances here in the near future as we bring, begin to upgrade our network to these new speeds. And then also I wanna mention uh, what's been going on with another partner, uh, open source organization, ONF, and some really great work going on in terms of opening up access, and specifically I wanted to call out the SEBA program, the SDN enabled broadband access program. And this is again bringing much more uh, commoditized hardware solutions, open solutions, but also open source software uh, to bring higher speeds, better services uh, across our wireline infrastructure as well. And so a lot of great work going on there. And then also, we've also announced uh, this week uh, a lot of work in the white box space. We actually have a deployment now uh, in Toronto and London that are now live where we deployed a white, white box solution uh, with a routing stack that's part, that will be part of Danos. And that's something that we will introduce into the community here soon. And our expectation is to take that white box implementation with that uh, software stack uh, to 76 countries by end of this year. So really, really great work going on by the teams. So I want to show, um, so why open source? And I get this a lot. Um, and it really is about making the network much more relevant and making the network, and when you think about 5G, uh, something that's more accessible to developers to use to create you know, all these amazing new use cases that are gonna come down the pike here shortly. And the fundamental tenets of making that a reality, making that network more re relevant, making it more programmable, is about openness. And this is really important here, and this is obviously by the name itself, literally, open source is to draw in greater communities 
to solve these uh, and build these uh, solutions much faster, much more effectively. And then also, there's a lot of myth out there that says, hey, is open source really safe? Is it really secure? And I'm here to tell you actually open source is more secure, is the most secure approach to take. Because when you look at a proprietary implementation, a closed implementation, which is really only controlled by just a few, there's a much, much, much more power um, with a much greater community. And if you think about the more eyeballs you can have looking at the code, testing it, using it, finding vulnerabilities, fixing them immediately, uh, that's, uh, that's really how you get the most robust, the most secure code out there. And if you want a, a testament to that, you know, just look at you know, the most ubiquitous uh, project, open source project out there, and that's Linux. In fact, Linux, most people don't realize, Linux is probably more part of your lives, your connected lives, than we realize. But that project in itself, with just the global reach and the global eyeballs looking at that base of code, is constantly being uh, upgraded and checked and made better. In fact, the Linux kernel is actually patched nine times every hour. So whenever there's some little improvement or some little issue found, it's immediately identified and it's corrected. And nowhere can you get velocity like that other than having a large community uh, aligned on making it better. And so that's why security is so important and why we believe open source is more secure. And then um, finally but not least, we believe open source is going to open up a whole new level of interoperability. So in, again, these traditional areas of the network that have been very um, you know, controlled by a few, we're now opening up to the power of many. And this is where we're going to lower that entry barrier for innovation so we can get more speed, get more interesting, more disruptive solutions in uh, that can really propel and take networking to the next level. So I think, and I hope you agree with me, open source has a tremendous future in everything we do. And um, I'm just uh, really pleased to see so many people jumping on this bandwagon and being a part of it. So that's my talk, and I just want to thank you again for your contributions, your participation and support of this uh, incredible journey we on, we're on together, and uh, thank you for all that you do.